Revelation 21, we, we've turned a corner and we've talked about a lot of different things over the course of the time. We began talking about the revelation, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ is what the scripture says about revelation. And, and it gives a picture in the end of Revelation chapter one, uh, John is told by God to write the things which are and the things which will come. And this book is roughly structured in the first couple chapters there have to do with things that are and he writes to the churches. The seven churches along the postal route of Asia Minor. And he writes them a word to the church. And those words were incredible to look at because as they spoke to them back then, they still speak to us today. Um, we come, came out of that, we get this amazing throne room picture of God in Revelation chapter four, going into chapter five. And then chapter six starts and we have all of these future judgments that are detailed for us. Um, through the six through the end of 19, we, we've got a cycling series of seven of bowls and trumpets. Actually, it's um, seals, trumpets, and bowl judgments that we read through. And we get all this other kind of pictures and, and weird stuff sometimes because this is apocalyptic, prophetic work. So we have to be careful how we study it. We have to be careful how we seek to understand it. But we've been learning about the coming judgment where God sets the world right, where he judges sin once once and for all, and now we get to turn a page because we've just read about the millennial kingdom last week and the great white throne judgment and some other things, and now we get to talk about heaven. Oh, we get to talk about heaven. This has been a long haul to talk about heaven, but let's not miss these last two chapters. They're incredible chapters. And one of the things that we're gonna see in, in these last two chapters is one of the images John gives us about the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It says, like a bride or like a bride prepared for her husband. We get in two verses, one of the themes is a wedding theme. And I was reminded as I was reading this this past week about, um, I, I made a note of it just to make sure. Yeah, 17 years ago, <laughs> 17 years ago, I was interning right now. I was interning in Franklin, Tennessee at a church down there. I was finishing up my, my bachelor's degree and I got to work with some amazing people in sharing the gospel and leading worship and all this kind of stuff. But one of the things that was really hard about that small series of time is that for about three and a half months, three months, my, my soon to be wife and I had to be separated, all right? We were high school sweethearts. We grew up from the age of like 16 or so and we knew each other and we started dating in high school and then we both went to Cedarville which wasn't that far away from where we lived growing up. So we got to see each other all the time and so in January of 2006, I loaded my car with a bunch of stuff, guitars and all this kind of stuff and I drove down to Tennessee and then we were separated for a time. And there's this picture of wedding that comes here. There's this picture of a bride prepared for her husband because as, and here's the thing, I, I know some of y'all have been separated for much longer times than three and a half months. Frankly, we saw each other at least once a month and I even got to surprise her one time, just showed up on her doorstep. I had to like keep ignoring phone calls because she wanted to know where I was and I was like almost to her house. Anyways, all that doesn't matter. Uh, except to say, there's this great longing when you're getting ready for a wedding. There's this great anticipation because the hope is that you will always be with that person. And as we got ready to get married, that was the anticipation. There's, there's gonna be no time which we will be separated. Now, we've taken trips and stuff which has done that. We've, we've worked and stuff which has done that. But there's a sense of closeness and intimacy that is captured in this language. And it's almost as if God is saying, when it comes down to all of these last things, and he comes down to this eternal state where we have an eternal home with him, it's like the wedding is here. We are now fully and finally together. While we were dating, while we were engaged, we could communicate by phone. Text message wasn't really too much of a thing back then. We might communicate by an email or an instant message, if any of you know what that is. Um, it's not the same as being together. But here's the picture of heaven. God's dwelling is with humanity. And he will live with them. And he will be their, their God. And they will be his people. And almighty God will be with them. I want to invite you, if you're able to, to stand as we read the scripture today. Revelation chapter 21. Oh, 
we could almost just read this and go home, mind you. I just love this passage. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more mourning or death or crying or pain because the former things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he says to John, write for these words, they're faithful and they're true. Then he said to me, they are done. I am the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who have the seven bowls of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like precious stone, as a stone of clear, crystal clear jasper. It had a high and great wall. It had 12 gates, and at those gates, 12 angels, and names have been written on those gates, which are, gates which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three gates on the north, three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city laid out as a square and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like pure glass. The foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the, fir the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysolite, so praise the 11th jacinth the 12th amethyst and the 12 gates were 12 pearls each one of the gates was a single pearl and the streets of the city were pure gold like transparent glass and i saw no sanctuary in it for the lord god the almighty and the lamb are its sanctuary and the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it for the glory had illumined it and the its lamp is the lamb and nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be closed for there will be no night there. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it and nothing defiled and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your grace the power of your spirit who leads and guides us into all right things and guides us into all truth. Lord, would you take the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, may they be pleasing before you. God, I know that they're pleasing because we are new in Christ. If we've been set free, God, we are free indeed. But may all that we do today bring honor and glory to the name that is above every name, Jesus. We pray, amen. Please be seated. So, whew, we could, we could sit down after that one. We could go home after that one because it's just an incredible, we did sit down after that one, that's good. Um, we, we could go home after that one because it's just an incredible picture of the eternal state. I've entitled this morning, Our Eternal Home, because it's not just an eternal state of being. It has to do where believers will dwell with God forever. Did you hear me? Forever. 
there is a longing in every single human heart that longs for eternity. Now there are some who, who push that away because what they long for most is themselves. I mean, that, that's the lie that the serpent told Eve in the garden. Don't you know, if you eat this, you will be like God. He wanted her to believe that she was God because he himself believed he was God. But the incredible thing about our eternal home is everything is set in right order. There's no longer any crying or pain or sickness. The former things, the, the, the way that we experience life in the present, it's passed away. We can feel that very deeply. And in fact, we do feel that very deeply. Um, this last week, um, we, we found out about a week ago that one of my wife's friends, her, her mom suddenly passed away. And so on Friday last week, we made a quick trip to um, central Ohio to go show up for a funeral um, just to show love to a dear, dear friend who's been our friend for, for decades now. Um, we, we have this aching in our lives when you see um, sin, when you see brokenness, when you see death, that you go, we're not meant for this. It, even watching, of all things, football last week, you've probably heard that there was a football player who collapsed on the field, was resuscitated on the field, was resuscitated back in the hospital again too. And the game was in Cincinnati, Ohio, we were watching it. There's a shock that came over the announcers. There, there's a shock that came over the players as there should be because we're not made for that. We're not made for that. God, when he created Humans, he created them in his image and he placed them in a garden where they would live um, with him forever. Sin messed all that up and we'll talk about that more next week from garden to garden when we look at Revelation chapter 22. But we're not made for this world. We're made for a place, we're designed by God for a place where brokenness is healed, where life is restored. Where, where, where truth is pursued, where God's glory and God's presence is the most important thing that matters for us and for the people of God. It, it's an incredible picture that we have here in this text. And John describes it here in the first four verses by saying there's a new heaven and a new earth because what you see here has passed away. It's a new heaven, a new earth, because here is so broken that God's not gonna just like, I'm gonna patch this or do this. I'm gonna make things new. Now, there's been a whole lot of speculation and a whole lot of conversation over the decades of what does this new heaven and new earth look like? I, I wonder, and this is kind of based on some of the thoughts that Randy Alcorn has in his amazing book on heaven, is will it be a lot like what we experience here, but also not a lot like what we experience here? Like, we'll have relationship. There'll be amazing creation. We're introduced to a city here. There's apparently a city there, you know? There'll be things that will go, yeah, I understand what this looks like. It's not completely foreign to me. But on the other hand, it is completely foreign to me because you and I have never seen a world that existed without sin. You and I have never seen a world that didn't exist without brokenness. And that's why God is making all things new. There's just new heaven and new earth for the first heaven. The first earth had passed away. The sea no longer existed. And we're introduced to the city. And when you think about cities, um, cities are not just walls. Cities are people. When you talk about Zealand, I mean, you could talk about the topography of Zealand or you could talk about the topography of Grand Rapids or something like that, but... but does it matter that much? I mean, it does, but it really doesn't. When I talk about Zealand and I talk about going home to Zealand, I think about the people. I think about the people who we're going to be with. So when we think about this new city, yeah, it's a city. And in fact, later in chapter 21, there's all these great just visuals of here's what it looks like. Here are its dimensions, length, width, height. Here's how wide its walls are. Here's what its walls look like. He's giving us all these kind of things. But when we think about a city, it's not just about what it's made out of. It's about the people who dwell there. It, it's about how they dwell with God. Notice how it says it here. You know, he, he gives this bride adorned for her husband image in verse two, and then he goes to verse three, and he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people, 
and God himself will be among them. He wants to find every possible way for us to understand this just isn't some theory. This is God personally, visibly dwelling with his people. And it's, the, it's one of the, the great narratives of the Bible because you have this picture in Genesis chapter one and two of creation and then you have God walking amongst Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. You have sin breaking fellowship and then you have the story of God restoring and reclaiming his people who are his. He sends Jesus who becomes um, the tabernacle of God here among men who then comes by the spirit of God to tabernacle within us. And we have this great picture that God himself will be among among them and he will be their God. And why? Because he's gonna do something that none of us could do. He's gonna wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's no more death. There's no more mourning. There's no more crying. There's no more pain. And when you're gathered at a funeral and when you experience the hardness of this life, You go, yeah, mourning, crying, and pain. God's not just going to bring people back to life. There's gonna be no more of that kind of stuff. He's gonna separate. He's gonna separate all that is good and holy and righteous and true. And God's people, Jew and Gentile, whose faith is in Jesus the Messiah, will dwell together in a new heavens and a new earth for all eternity where we won't experience the former things that we've experienced here not because we've earned it, not because we've deserved it, but because God has offered himself and he's offered us grace through his son. So John's writing. He's writing from the island of Patmos. He's looking over the sea. He's thinking about the new city that's gonna come down. This is a model from the Jerusalem, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a place they have this big model of ancient Jerusalem from the first century. I think it's the Jerusalem Museum. And he's saying God's dwelling place, God's tabernacle is going to be with them. Years ago, I didn't take this photo, but years ago, my wife and I got to go to Israel and we got to go to this place. It's in the wilderness, the Judean wilderness. And this is a replica model of the temple. It was 120 degrees. It was abysmally hot that day. And we walked like eight miles or something. Um, But you come into this And this is where in the Old Testament, this is a model of where God, his his spirit dwelt within this tent. When, when, When Israel was brought out of Egypt, God had them at some point built a tabernacle this tabernacle would be the thing that would be the center of their camp, that they would gather around and, and God would lead them and God would meet Moses in this. In fact, when Moses would leave this place, his face shone because the glory of God was just radiating from his face. And you, you, you come out of this place, well, you go into it the day we went and it's like, oh my word, get me out of here because it's 150 degrees in here. But it's the place in which God's spirit rested until Jesus came along and then Jesus came and he dwelt among us. God himself came in human form. As we read from Philippians 2, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why? Because God's intent was to dwell with you. God's intent was to dwell with me. See, sin not only mars the holiness of God, it it, it not only promotes an untruth, what it does is it breaks our relationship with God. We're all born broken. We're all born with a relationship that can only be restored by Jesus' blood. Um, When we come into faith, we get the amazing promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send you a counselor. I'm going to send you a comforter. He will be with you. What this gives us a picture of is, well, we experience the amazing power of God within us through his Holy Spirit. This will be God dwelling permanently forever and will be in his presence. In fact, I love the way that Steve Lawson says it. He says, wherever we go, we will enjoy the complete manifestation of God's presence. This is talking about the new heaven and new earth. Throughout all eternity, he says, we will never be separated from the direct, unhindered, fellowship with God. Sometimes when we talk about heaven, we talk about it as the place by and by or the place up in the sky, and it becomes this kind of like 
place that's kind of hard to describe. And, and as I've said, it is kind of a place that's hard to describe because it's hard to understand something that you haven't fully seen or haven't fully experienced. But when we think about heaven, sometimes we think, oh, it's gonna be like another tent or it's gonna be like another city that comes down. But at the center of all this is God's dwelling with humanity. I mean, just, just think about it for a moment. What comes into your mind when you think about heaven? I'm sure that there's many things you could say, but at the center of all this, the center of all the things we have as God's people to look forward to, we have the one who is our shelter in the center of everything. We have the one who is our life. Um, we are in perfect relationship in his presence forever. When, when we think about this, it, it's an amazing picture of a God who loves his people so much that he would send his only son to redeem and to restore, not just to remove their death and their mourning and their crying and their pain, not to remove just the hardness that comes from life, but to be with his people. See, when we think about heaven, one of the things we've got to think about first and foremost front of our minds is I will be in the presence of God forever. Forever. The presence of God. That's an incredible thing to think about um, because we go about our life in very normal ways here on earth. And, and actually, even throughout the ages, um, it, it's been talked about um, for example, in the Middle Ages, I love what Randy Alcorn says. He says, before the Middle Ages, he says, people thought of heaven in a very tangible way, as a city or a paradise or a garden portrayed in scripture. He says, in the 12th century theologians, they philosophized heaven to the point where it was viewed as impersonal, cold, and scientific. It became spiritual rather than a real eternal dwelling place. He says, while well, God is the center of the new heavens and the new earth, he says, we can take these words in a very plain manner. There's a physical resurrection. Um, paradise is restored to earth as it is in Genesis 1. Culture and community are redeemed to the glory of God. We have new promised bodies from God. We, we have an incredible gift of dwelling with him forever. We, we, we have this walk in this fellowship and this intimacy that we experience in part now and then we then experience it in full and we continue to grow in that relationship with God forever. See, when we think about heaven, sometimes it becomes a theory. This isn't a theory. This is a real existence with the God who loves you, the God who gave his son for you, the God who stepped down into humanity because he wanted you to experience life and life is always found in walking with him. What comes to your mind when you think about heaven? He says here, the first things have passed away. Verse five, the one who, seats on the, who sits on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. Write these words for they are faithful and true. He says, it is done or they are done. And he says, I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. The idea here is he is both the source of all things and he is the purpose or the end of all things. He says, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. If you're a uh, person walking the ancient roads of Israel, you know what water's like because you're taking your water and you're going up to Jerusalem and you're stopping at a well here, you're stopping at a well here. Water is life. Jesus is saying here through a picture, I, I will give to you the, the one who thirsts, the spring of the water of life without cost. And it harkens back some of Jesus' words from the gospel of John where he says, come to me, I have living water. I think it's John chapter seven. My water will satisfy. In John chapter four, he meets with a woman at a well and he says, ah, I have water that you do not know of. I have water that will never make you thirst again. 
This is the promise of heaven. It's the promise of being with him forever. He says in verse um, seven here of Revelation, he says, he who overcomes, and the word overcome here, it, it's the word nakao. It comes, it's from where we get the word Nike. It, it's, this, it's this idea of victory. He says, the one who is victorious or the one who overcomes, um, sorry, my page went crazy. Um, the one who overcomes, he says, I will give him these things. He will inherit them. But notice what he says after this. I will be his God and he will be my son. Again, just another picture of relationship that's going on here. And the one who overcomes, by the way, we studied this a while ago, but the one who overcomes is not someone who does all the right things. It's someone who believes and trusts that Jesus is the son of God. That's how you experience this overcoming kind of life. And he, and he contrasts these two, because if, if you remember, we've been through Revelation and we're, we're looking about how God's going to set all the evil right. He's saying those who are cowardly, unbelieving, and he gives this whole list of things and, and he basically just places it before these believers. And he says to them, he says to us, there's going to be people who have walked in their own self-sufficiency, who've chosen self over God, who've chosen to worship other things other than God. And he says, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which we saw in your study last week with Pastor Tom. And he's contrasting these two things because he's telling a people who are persecuted, who are struggling, who know what it's like to lose loved ones, who know what it's like to be cut off from their families, who know what it's like to experience hardship in this life. There's coming a time when that will be no more. The new heavens and the new earth. And then we get this amazing picture in verses nine through 14 of all these different parts of the, um, of, of the new city and the new heavens. You've got, you've got walls and foundations made from 12 stones that include the sons of Israel, that include the apostles. Um, and all these things are described in very, you know, incredible pictures. In fact, if you're an artist, I'd love to see you do a rendering of this, make, make it your own based upon these things. You know, like 12,000 stadia here, when it describes the new heavens and the new earth, that's about 1,400 miles length by width, by height. You've got 144 cubit f walls, which is around 200 feet. And you've got all these amazing gemstones. You've got pearls that are themselves a part of the gate, but you've got these gates that never close because this is, a, this is a time in existence where you don't have to close a gate. In, in the ancient period, you would close a gate because you would want to keep people out or you might want to keep people in. You'd close a gate for protection. You'd want to place your city in a secure spot. You want to make sure that someone who wasn't authorized to come in, the picture of the new heaven and the new earth is one where the gates are open all the time because there is no more sin. There's no more um, conniving. There's no more theft. There's no more um, hardship. There's, there, there's no more of the things that we experience now there. We have this picture that is given throughout all of scripture and it's given in several passages of scripture. One of the great passages of scripture is from Isaiah where he talks about this. He says in Isaiah that he will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. I'm the alpha, the omega Alpha and Omega, this part right here, Alpha, Omega, beginning and end, source and purpose. We're given other passages in the book of Isaiah, which talks a lot about heaven, like this one where it says, no more will the sun give you daylight nor moonlight shine on you, but Yahweh will be your everlasting light. Your God will be your splendor. Your sun will set no more, nor will your moon wane for Yahweh will be your everlasting light. Your days of mourning will be over. We're given this picture that, that the sun and the moon really don't have much to do about anything because what overpowers the sun and the moon, if there is a sun and the moon there, um, is this glory of the, of the Lord, which radiates, and of the lamb, which radiates. There's no more night there. I don't know if you like to sleep, but if you like to sleep, maybe you'll sleep in the day. I don't know. Maybe you'll just be given, maybe we'll just be given energy and, and strength to keep going and keep going and keep going with what God has for us. 
But God's painting a picture that there's going to be a city, a city in which we will dwell in together, a city that has no sanctuary in it, verse 22, because God, the Almighty, and its Lamb are its sanctuary, where the nations walk by its light and the kings bring their glory into it because there's no more war, there's no more pain, there's no more struggle, there's no more ugh, that we feel here on this earth. We're, we're given this amazing picture. And as I'm looking at this and thinking about the new Jerusalem, this is a gate of the old Jerusalem, but as we're thinking about the new Jerusalem that is going to come one day, it's like, oh, how do I live with that in my frame? How do I live here in the world God has placed me for the time he has placed me here? How do I live intentionally knowing that this is the thing that I long for? It's hard to do sometimes because sometimes you can have your mind and your heart so much there that you forget that you're here. There's, there's a portion of this though where I think that's part of God's intention. He wants our sights to be set on the hope in heaven reserved for us because that's, that's our future. He doesn't want us to forget that, but he wants us to live in light of that reality here and now. One of the great places where heaven is talked about in the New Testament is 2 Peter. If you turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and we've looked at this passage before, even in this series, it's talking about the day of the Lord and, and, and how there's going to be coming where, where God, there's going to be a time where God will come and he will set things right. Um, and he says this, let's pick it up in verse eight, um, second Peter chapter three, verse eight. I love to hear those turning pages of your Bibles. I'll let you get another minute to get there. Second Peter, it's towards the end of the New Testament. It's not too many pages away, just before we, where we've been at. And second Peter Chapter three, verse eight, says this, but do not let this fact escape your notice, beloved. I love that, that Peter calls the people of God beloved, because that's what they are. That with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some consider slowness, but he's patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God waits because he longs to see people come to repentance. He longs to see people turn from their sin and acknowledge him as the son of God who gave his life for them. That's his desire. He gives us the ability to choose that, but that's his desire. He, he longs to see them come to repentance. But he says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be found out. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, he says, what sort of people ought you, ought you, be, ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because which the heavens burning will be destroyed and the elements will melt with intense heat. Did you notice what he said there? How should we then walk in this world as we await the coming of the Lord? Holy conduct and godliness, verse 11. Holy conduct and godliness. The things that should comprise our heart, our mind, our purposes should be the things that God wants to do in and through his people. Holiness is something that comes from God. Godliness is something that comes from God. It's something that God wants to work in and through his people. See, we're, we're promised a, a world in which God himself is with us and he will be our, our God and, and we will never be absent from the physical manifestation of his presence. But God has given us his spirit to say, here is how I want you to act in this situation in your family and in this situation in your work and in this situation in your school. And it's summed up by holy conduct 
and godliness. Uh, our, our lives should be thinking towards what we will experience with a perfect holiness and a perfect godliness and a perfect no sin. But we should seek by the power of God to walk in this way here now as we look for, he says in verse 12, and we hasten the coming day of the Lord. Verse 13 says, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. R righteousness is an incredibly loaded word. It, it's a word that, that um, has to do with doing right in all things. It has to do with being um, set apart for things. Uh, it, it's, it's a word that actually only perfectly describes one person who's ever walked the earth, Jesus himself, because he is our righteousness. This is how we are to look forward to a new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells, which we will dwell with God, with, with God forever. How are we to walk though? Holy conduct and godliness. We're to, we're to walk in light with what we will one day be with God forever. We, we, we should walk in that same frame here today because what we will experience in heaven with all of its beauty and glory and splendor that I can't even begin to fully understand what we will experience is God himself, which is what he wants us to experience right now. God himself walking with us. How are we to walk? Holy conduct and godly living. We're to look for the fulfillment of his promised return and dwelling with him in the new heavens and the new earth. And there's something else he says here in the next couple of verses. He says, therefore, beloved, since you are looking for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace spotless and blameless, which only comes through the work of Christ in our life. And that is who we are in Christ. And consider, he says, the patience of our Lord is salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul did, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. I love this little side note. This doesn't really have to do with our study, but he says this about Paul. He says, also in his letters, speaking in them all these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. It's like, yeah, Paul is speaking truth. Yeah, he's hard to understand, but stay grounded in the word of God which is another way we are to walk. I mentioned at the beginning of our time, one of the most transformative things for our life today is to be grounded in the scripture because it is the word of God. Nothing can replace us opening the text and allowing God to speak. Nothing can do it. Um, the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom in the hard parts to understand, but it's how we understand and how we stay grounded in the truth of God in this time. You therefore, he says, beloved, knowing this beforehand, he says, be on your guard, lest you, having been carried away by the error of unprincipled men, fall from your own steadfastness. He says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity forever. How are we supposed to live in this moment as we await the next? Can I sum it up with this? Be so preoccupied with Jesus that everything else comes in second. Be so preoccupied with Jesus that everything else comes in second. I don't know about you. One of, one of, my, um, one of my challenges is this little thing. <laughs> you become preoccupied. You wake up, check your message. You wake up, you check your email. You wake up, you check your news. It's a sanctifying work of God to let that be second and to let him be first. I don't know about you. I get anxious because I look at the news and the things around us and I go, God, what are you going to do in this? Be so preoccupied with Jesus that everything else comes in second. You experience hardship in your life, real hardship, loss, pain, physical pain. There's one day where that will one day go away. In this moment, ask God for the grace to be so preoccupied with him that everything else comes in second. Where are you at today? What comes first? What preoccupies you? Let it be for all of us today. 
and tomorrow and the next day that Jesus himself would be the one that preoccupies our heart. That he would be the one that would preoccupy our mind. That he would be the one that we would long for more than any other thing. More than living in a world where sin is no more. More than living in a world where there's no crying or no more pain and no more tears. May it be that the thing, the person that we desire most, we would cultivate in this life is this desire to be so in tune with him that we would know and we would walk day by day in this moment for his glory because he's with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. And, and God, it's, it, it's hard for me to even begin sometimes to wrap my mind around what heaven is like. The questions pop up all the time. Will it be like this? Will it be like that? God, would you satisfy us right now with you? Would you, Father, we trust you to meet our needs. A lot of us, God, have, have needs that are unspoken. They might be uh, emotional needs. They might be physical needs. They might be spiritual needs this morning, God. Um, you are the great provider. You are our healer. You are our friend. You have promised to always be with us even until the end of the age. So God, we, we yield to you our sense of inadequacy. We yield to you our brokenness. And we trust you to be more than enough for us. Lord, as we are now in our second, beginning of our second full week in this new year, we, we don't know what the things what things we will experience in the days and weeks and months ahead. But God, may we be preoccupied, so preoccupied, so enamored with a relationship with you like a bride is with her husband, like, like a son is with his father. That God, we would, we would walk daily resting in your care. Father, we pray for the world around us. There's so much brokenness. There's so much pain. And God, we, we, we can't fix it in, in the ways in which we might want to many times in this earth. In those moments, God, and even in the moments where we can bring hope and we can bring physical need and we can bring uh, care, in those moments, remind us, God, that you long to be our savior and you long to be the savior of the people in our world who are walking in just in another direction away from you. God, may we present in real tangible ways the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God, would you use us to introduce people to you? to a person who will one day dwell with his people forever and ever. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.